Hello, I'm Carlos Hoyos. I'm uh, Charles Sakatri, the coordinator of EF4, and I'm here to talk to you about psychiatric conditions, all of them in one short video. As you know, this is the fourth of a series of um, four videos that I've prepared as an introduction. I suspect some of you might have decided to cut off the other ones and go straight for the pathology. Um, my advice is watch the other videos, you'll make the most out of this one. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk about seven uh, of key conditions um, uh, in psychiatry. So um, the first two of them are the bulk of psychiatry and mental illness, depression and anxiety. Uh, then another one, which is the star of mental health, so the proper madness, the psychosis. And then I'm going to talk about drugs and alcohol and dimensions, neurocognitive problems, which are what we call organic psychiatry, things to do mostly with the brain and um, with the damage that drugs do or ageing or um, kind of uh, neuro degenerative conditions do. And then I'm going to talk about uh, two other conditions which are to do with the way people are as opposed to things that happen to them. And that's personality disorders and disorders of neurodevelopment, things that happen as you grow up, uh, like autism and ADHD. I'm not going to cover eating disorders, functional somatic symptoms, learning disabilities or perinatal psychiatry, even though they are very important because I just can't cover everything in the time I've got. And those are the key conditions that we focus on in year four. So let me get started with uh, the big ones. Uh, so depression and anxiety. So as you can see, um, eight out of 100 people have both depression and anxiety. And uh, an extra 3% of population suffer from depression without anxiety. And an extra 12% of the population suffer from anxiety. This, these are huge numbers. Um, these are a big part of the population. Psychosis only affects uh, about 1% to 2% of the population, but it is a very crippling and disabled um, illness. So it is important that you know about it. Alcohol and neurocognitive uh, problems are also very big. So alcohol, the top end of the damage of alcohol, the, the people whose uh, lives are blighted by alcohol, that's about 1.5% of the population and about 85% of them never received any treatment. Neurocognitive disorders, that's dementia and acute confusional states, are not that common on the, on the 65, but uh, they become very common in over 65 and you'll see more about that. The last two are um, neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and ADHD that are prevalent through life and they're quite frequent, so much more frequent than th things that you have heard about like schizophrenia. And then there's the personality disorders, which is very commonly a comorbidity uh, of the other mental health problems and a big problem uh, uh, in the general population as well. So that's what I'm going to cover, and, and that's roughly how big those problems are. Uh, so let me start with depression. So I will only say a few things about depression and anxiety to begin with. So depression is um, an, a disorder of sadness. Uh, so uh, 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 the feeling of sadness, which is normally evoked by loss, um, uh, is associated with depression. You will hear a lot of people saying, oh, I'm feeling a bit depressed. What they're feeling is a bit sad. Depression is a technical, a clinical name that, that denotes a condition, not a common experience that everybody has, such as sadness. The same thing happens with anxiety. Anxiety or worry are very common feelings for everybody to experience. There are to do with worrying about the future. And uh, a lot of people would say, oh, I am very anxious about, you know, getting into the medical school or whatever. What they're describing is a, a symptom and using the name of a condition. So anxiety disorders and depression or depressive disorders are different to those two feelings which a lot of people experience. But it's worth discussing those a little bit. So feelings of sadness or worry about the future are normal. Everybody experiences them. They're even adaptive. If people who don't uh, have experiences of sadness or worry uh, don't do very well in life. Um, uh, and, and they are uh, 
to do with people's temperament. Some people uh, uh, do experience a lot of sadness and worry more than others. It's a temperamental trait. And uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. So people who have a lot of sadness and anxiety, as long as they don't develop a depression or an anxiety disorder, tend to do very well because they're very... Um, um, uh, very careful to not lose things and very careful to plan for the future. So they usually uh, do very well. So it is um, a, a, a temperamental trait that what it does is it makes you sensitive to your environment. People who are who don't have much sadness or worry uh, do well whatever their environment. That's the meaning of those two negative emotions, sadness and worry. But let's talk about depression as a condition. So the condition of depression um, uh, uh, requires in psychiatry three symptoms. One is persistent low mood. Not short periods of very low mood, but persistent periods of low mood going for weeks. Yes? As followed by a lack of energy. So, uh, so people who are depressed are not just sad, they have no energy. And the third symptom is anhedonia, i.e. the inability to experience pleasure. So when you take a history from somebody who's depressed and you ask them when was the last time you enjoyed doing something, often they will say, oof, months, I can't remember the last time I had any fun. Yes. So those are the three core symptoms of depression. You don't need to have all three to be categorized as a depression. You can have a mild or moderate depression with two of them, uh, but three of those are the three cardinal symptoms that we use for a diagnosis. There are other symptoms associated with depression. So often there are thoughts, um, negative thoughts about the self, you know, uh, feelings of inferiority or guilt, um, or uh, they feel they're blamed or shamed. Uh, and also negative feelings about the future. They tend to be very pessimistic. Everything is going to go downhill from now on. Um, and often very negative thoughts about the world. So the world is a terrible place. Everything is awful. Those three ways of thinking are called the psychological syndrome of depression. And these are patterns of thought that are frequently found in people who are depressed. Uh, but the, the thoughts themselves don't define a depressive disorder. You need to have the three core symptoms, but those come across very often. There's a separate syndrome, which is what we call the somatic syndrome of depression, which is a collection of symptoms which are mainly to do with the, the bodies, the soma. And these are um, um, uh, symptoms that are not psychological. They're, they're to do with the way your body reacts and the things like uh, loss of appetite, anorexia or uh, loss of sleep, uh, insomnia, particularly in the early hours of the day. Also psychomotor retardation, so people become more slow, sluggish um, and uh, there is a diurnal variation of mood so they tend to be particularly low in the mornings and slightly better in the evenings um, and, and those four symptoms form the somatic syndrome. So, in order to di diagnose depression, you need two of the three core symptoms, and then you need to look for the psychological syndrome or the somatic syndrome. Uh, the treatment of depression is very easy. Uh, antidepressants, uh, SSRIs, there are other antidepressants, but for the purposes of this video, stick with those two, fluoxetine and sertraline. They're effective. About 80% of people respond to them, but they have some side effects, which you need to know because they're very common. And there is about 100 million people in the world taking and, uh, SSRIs, so they do happen. The, the, the scary ones are agitation and anxiety. The common ones are gastrointestinal sy symptoms like sickness in digestion. There's dizziness, there's loss of appetite, loss of sleep, and affects sex, both sex drive, capacity to have orgasms or, um, or achieve erections. And uh, th that last one, not a lot of people will, will tell their GP unless the GP checks with them. So, so this is very important. Uh, all doctors prescribe antidepressants, so you need to know this. You also need to know that CBT is just as effective as SSRIs, and, and some people argue that it's more effective on the long on the long term. People who have courses of CBT are less likely to uh, um, have depression uh, recurrently uh, later. There are other treatments. Family therapy works, especially in younger people. And things like exercise and diet help very much in depression. Lastly, you need to know that we still do 
ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, for cases of severe depression once the other things have failed. Uh, and when you do your placement in, in year four, you will learn more about that. So uh, that's depression uh, taken care of. Let's talk a little bit about anxiety. Anxiety is the other big uh, mental health problem. And uh, the, 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 the disorder of anxiety also has um, a somatic syndrome, so a set of symptoms that are to do with the body, usually the autonom autonomic system. And those are overbreathing and uh, uh, the feeling of butterflies in your stomach, so, so uneasy in, in your stomach, and also uh, um, tachycardia and uh, high blood pressure, also tremors, um, and uh, a, a, a sense of, uh, of uh, being hot and sweating, uh, particularly in the hands. Those are kind of nervous autonomic symptoms um, uh, that are pretty prevalent in um, in anxiety. But anxiety also has a set of behaviours that are associated with um, with the, the whole picture. And that's the things people do when they suffer anxiety. And very often people uh, go away, people avoid things that give them anxiety or try to escape situations. Often they lose their sleep. Uh, very often they look the for the proximity of attachment figures, particularly children, when they become anxious, they immediately want to go to their moms. But it's the same in adults. They, there is a sense of a need to cling on to other people when people are anxious. But they also become hypervigilant. They are on the lookout for threats and things that are very common behaviour. And lastly, there are a set of symptoms that happen in the minds of people who are uh, suffering from anxiety. And those are a sense of continuous alert. Uh, also sense of dread and the feeling that you might die and at any moment or that you will die. Often negative thoughts, um, not necessarily like in depression, kind of chronic and over time, but acute sense of doom and things being terrible. And, and they often get spooked. And those are kind of, in general, the three sets of symptoms that we associate with anxiety. And people who have anxiety disorders are very familiar with this uh, picture and they of, uh, have it a lot of the time. There are different types of anxiety, but there are different combinations of these symptoms. I'm going to go through them uh, quickly. Uh, so the what I have described is was normally referred to as general anxiety disorder, which has a somatic symptom a behavioural symptom and a psychological sy syndrome. And those happen most of the time, people with general anxiety disorder. There is a specific type of anxiety, which are phobias, where the somatic picture is very much the same, but the behaviour is uh, coloured mainly by avoidance. And the psychological aspect of it is very focused on one particular irrational fear or a trigger of the anxiety. So it could be uh, in closed places like in um, claustrophobia or open spaces and lots of people as, as in uh, uh, agoraphobia or just other people like in social phobia or spiders or dogs. What happens in phobias is that uh, um, there is anxiety mainly around one uh, stimulus and avoidance of that stimulus um, and, and huge anxiety if that stimulus cannot be avoided. That is slightly similar to uh, panic disorder. Panic disorder is in itself uh, a type of anxiety, very often seen uh, together with general anxiety disorder and phobias. So in panic, uh, uh, the, the, the somatic uh, picture is the same, although it peaks. And it peaks because of a behavioural aspect of panic disorder, which is overbreathing. This is at the center of panic disorder. So the anxiety makes people with panic disorder overbreathe. Um, they de they they deplete their carbon dioxide, which in turn makes them more anxious. They enter into a vicious cycle, and that triggers thoughts of death and and gloom, and also a very acute somatic symptom that uh, ends up in a panic attack. Then we have a more complex type of anxiety, which is uh, OCD or, or obsessive compulsive disorder, which has a, a more genetic basis and it's linked to other neurological conditions such as Tourette's, um, uh, in which there is a somatic picture, but is not as uh, frequent or as common because uh, that, that somatic anxiety is avoided thanks to 
to uh, behavioral and psychological str uh, um, um, strategies. So behaviorally, they indulge in rituals and um, uh, compulsions. So that's behaviors they feel they need to do in order to avoid anxiety, very often irrational and very often ritualistic, like they have to wash their hand 22 times and they have to check the door uh, four times or um, they have to wash their hands, uh, you know, all those uh, things in a ritualistic behavioral way and that fends off anxiety and that's accompanied by um, uh, obsessions which is uh, thoughts uh, about one particular subject uh, that um, that is not something they want to think about but it's something they cannot get out of their heads um, and those are often preoccupations about things going wrong uh, sometimes about contamination some about about safety or or, or or sometimes about sex or religion and those are take hold of the minds of people with OCD. So uh, op uh, OCD obsessions and compulsions, but it is an anxiety disorder. And lastly, a slightly different type of anxiety disorder, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, in which people have extremely acute uh, hyper arousal and anxiety reactions, often very acutely triggered by one specific experience, a flashback or uh, something that reminds them of a particular traumatic event and that triggers avoidance behaviour. So people with T PTSD know what will bring on um, uh, an acute uh, episode of anxiety and they tend to avoid those. And, and those are the most common types of anxiety. Now, uh, you need to know about treatment. The treatment is the same as in depression, SSRIs. Uh, in the case of OCD, at much, much higher doses, but usually that's the drug that we use more. CBT also works, like in depression, although it has different names for the different types of anxiety. Um, uh, we use other drugs. The, I'm not going to name them all, but beta blockers help with the somatic aspect of um, of, uh, of anxiety. And benzodiazepines are brilliant at removing all aspects of anxiety. The problem with them is they create tolerance. You need a bigger dose every time, and they're very addictive, and they're very difficult to give up. So we don't give benzodiazepines to people with anxiety disorders because a few weeks down the line, they have the same anxiety disorder, plus they're addicted to benzodiazepines. They're useful in short term, but not for people with chronic anxiety disorders. And that's all I'm going to say about anxiety and depression, which means I'm going to start um, talking now about psychosis, which is one of the difficult conditions to get your head around. So uh, psychosis, uh, about 1% to 2% of the population, uh, the first thing that is difficult about it is the word psychosis because we use the word psychotic as opposed to psychosis and it's difficult to work out what you mean. Psychotic is not an, a disorder. Psychotic is an adjective. And it's an adjective that applies to different things in different ways. So when we talk about a mind of somebody, so somebody is psychotic as in their mind, um, what we mean is that they are separate from reality. Being psychotic means that you live in a world where you are completely disconnected from reality. And that's not a, a psychiatric disorder. That is a way of describing um, a state of mind. Yes. Psychotic is also used as an adjective for certain symptoms. So delusions and hallucinations, which I've explained in the video on the mental state, are two particular symptoms which are called psychotic symptoms because they do separate you from reality. Uh, so we call psychotic symptoms. Yes. Uh, so somebody might be psychotic because of the state of mind uh, uh, not necessarily having delusions or hallucinations. Or somebody might have psychotic symptoms um, uh, if they have delusions or hallucinations. And finally, psychotic is also used as an adjective to conditions. So um, schizophrenia is a psychotic illness. Um, so are bipolar disorder and then drug and organic psychosis. So those are the psychosis. Psychosis, psychotic disorder, are what we call the psychosis. And it's different to say a psychosis than to be psychotic. Yes. So, for instance, one could argue that when people are acutely in love, their mind is in a state of psychosis because they're completely disconnected from every everything else. You could argue whether they suffer from delusions 
or not. But we, but the the word is used to describe a state of mind. It's also used to describe symptoms, and it's also de- used to describe conditions. So let's talk about those conditions. So the two uh, um, uh, psychosis, bipolar, and um, and schizophrenia. I'm going to say three things about them. They um, they run in families. Heritability is about one, is about point eight. Um, there are neurodevelopmental disorders. They're to do with the way the brain develops, and their uh, dopamine is very much implicated in in it. Uh, there are other neurotransmitters, glutamate and sure. Dopamine is the, the chemical involved in um, salience of things, things being important when things matter. So, so they become preoccupied. That's the dopamine. And anti-dopamine agents are antipsychotics. Okay? So the two symptoms, hallucinations and delusions, are uh, the two psychotic symptoms running all psychosis. In schizophrenia, you also have negative symptoms, and in bipolar, you also have mood problems. So uh, a lot of people think of them as a continuous uh, uh, because the the genetic risks are crossed over. So if you have relatives with bipolar, you have the same risk of having schizophrenia as if you had relatives with schizophrenia. And very often the picture changes. Sometimes people present with bipolar and a few years later present with schizophrenia. So they are linked, although for classification purposes, they are two different disorders. And there is something in between, which is the schizoaffective disorder, which has features of both. Genetically, autism is also linked to the psychosis, to psychosis psychotic illnesses. So a little bit about those disorders. So schizophrenia uh, has, as I said, hallucinations and delusions. They're of a particular kind. So hallucinations in schizophrenia tend to be auditory or olfactory, and they tend to be second and third person, and they tend to be true hallucinations. Delusions tend to be paranoid. I, they believe things that affect them. And there are uh, a, a set of uh, delusions that are quite specific to schizophrenia, which like having the experience of your thoughts being put into you or taken away from you or broadcast, as I explained in the video on mental state examination. Schizophrenia has another set of symptoms, which we call negative symptoms. They're negatives because they take away from the normal experience. And those symptoms are... Um, uh, uh, they develop over time, over years, and they cripple uh, people who suffer from schizophrenia uh, uh, chronically. They, they, people become less motivated to do things. They become less emotional. Uh, they become less sociable and sometimes antisocial. They, they stop looking after their hygiene. They stop caring about other people's uh, involvement in their lives. They become less sociable. Sometimes they lose their inhibitions and, so, and they lose their curiosity and their intellectual spark. Um, uh, this is a, a, a terrible aspect of schizophrenia. Uh, in bipolar, you also have the uh, hallucinations and delusions, but the quality is different. They tend to be what we call mood congruent. I, m- uh, manic people have uh, expansive, grandiose uh, um, hallucinations uh, and, and delusions, and uh, depressed people tend to uh, have hallucinations like voices telling them how, how awful they are. And the same happens with delusions. They are mood congruent and they are linked to how they're feeling. Of course, in bipolar, there is also a, a shift in mood. Uh, that's what defines bipolar disorder. So they become uh, high or manic or, or quite high, but not quite manic, like hypomanic or very depressed. This doesn't happen uh, from one day to the next. The periods of mania and the periods of um, depression take weeks. So um, uh, uh, the course of those illnesses is also different. So in schizophrenia, you get periods of, of psychosis, then they become normal, but they always tend to go back to a, a level below what they were before. There is a chronic decline in functioning. Whilst in bipolar, they would have a depression and then a bit of mania and then another depression and then another depression, but they always go back 
to the same level of functioning. So there are people with bipolar disorder holding on to very powerful jobs over time. So for instance, when I was a medical student, my professor of radiology had bipolar and he became either manic or depressed every two years and everybody knew that what, that what was happening and that had been going on for years. He was still able to uh, be, work as a professor. That wouldn't have happened if he had suffered from schizophrenia. So that's the course which is different. Now, treatment is also simple, uh, at least for the purposes of this video. So neuroleptics is how you treat schizophrenia, dopamine antagonist. And the most common, commonly used are risperidone, cathiapine and olanzapine. There is one clozapine that works on negative symptoms, but it does cause neutropenia and is very difficult to use. So that's only to be used by specialists, but you need to know about it. In terms of bipolar, bipolar is slightly more complicated, but actually not that much. So when people go manic, you give them neuroleptics, the same ones as, as in schizophrenia, or lansapine is the most effective one. When they're depressed, you give them SSRIs. And when you they're not manic nor depressed, but you want them to keep stable in mood, we use mood stabilizers. The star mood, mood stabilizer is lithium. Um, which works very well for 20 or 30 years until it, it hurts the kidneys. Uh, neuroleptics are also known to be effective mood stabilizers. And then anti-epileptics like sodium valproate or carbamazepine are used to keep m people stable. So that's the medication for bipolar disorder. So one, one more consideration around bipolar. Bipolar is not different in terms of symptoms from unipolar de depression. In fact, bipolar is classified under mood disorder, not with schizophrenia. Um, so there is a spectrum really that goes all the way to mood disorders because mood disorders can also have delusions and hallucinations. And of course, people with psychosis also can have mood problems. The difference is that the delusions and the hallucinations in psychosis are crucial and um, they're not necessarily linked to mood, whilst the delusions and the hallucinations in um, mood disorders are an extra and they're always linked to uh, uh, their mood. They're always mood congruent. So that's all I'm going to say about psychosis. Uh, so I'm going to uh, move on to talk a little bit about drugs and alcohol. Um, so um, um, uh, it is uh, an important part of health. But when we normally think of drugs and alcohol, uh, we picture kind of the hobos that we meet in the park, you know, alcohol people addicted to alcohol and who have had their life blighted by alcohol. I said 85% of them don't receive any treatment and there is about half a million of them in the UK. And that's what we think about. What we don't always think about is the high functioning people who nonetheless drink in excess of 50 or 100 units of alcohol uh, um, a week and uh, who suffer a lot of ill health and mental health because of that drinking. They, they don't drink that much more, but there are many, many, many of them. So a huge percentage of the population drinks uh, in excess of what's uh, uh, safe. And there is a lot of health pathology caused by drinking of alcohol. In terms of psychiatry, there is all the toxicity linked to alcohol, but there is also an aspect of psychology linked to alcoholism. So people uh, who end up addicted to drugs and alcohol um, have a phenotype which is this similar to the one we find in people with impulse control disorders, uh, people who uh, gamble or um, or or are people who become addicted to other kind of behaviors, not necessarily drugs and alcohol. And it's an unholy combination. Uh, uh, drinking uh, uh, makes your um, your body, your brain and your uh, the way you, pro you, you process uh, stimulus m m makes you more likely to to want to have alcohol and, and, and there's a combination of the three. I won't go into detail. It's a few words about alcohol and drugs that is important to know though. though. So dependence, which is uh, people who need to have drugs in order to function. Tolerance, which uh, means uh, that uh, uh, people uh, need higher quantities of that particular substance in order to achieve the same effects. Withdrawal, which is um, a, a, a somatic uh, or psychological state of extreme uh, uh, um, pain or being unwell when the substance is stopped. 
The other word is addiction. Uh, addiction means that uh, people want to stop doing something, but they can't. Uh, that's all it means. Um, then the, the idea of toxicity. So some drugs are more toxic than other drugs. So alcohol is much more toxic than cannabis. It's actually much more toxic than um, heroin. Uh, but heroin uh, um, uh, causes tolerance and dependence much quicker than alcohol. And then last two consideration is harm. So different drugs have different indexes of harm and that often is linked to legality. In terms of psychological t um, uh, aspects, uh, the, the psychology of addiction is linked to uh, other aspects like um, metabolism. So, for instance, there are people who have metabolism that mean that when they drink alcohol, they don't feel happy at all and they have body reactions. So that protects them from uh, becoming alcoholics. Things like ADHD, impulsivity, uh, that, that uh, correlates with um, um, becoming addicted to substance and experimenting. Also, early development ec experience of relatives' uh, uh, use of substances and also people who suffer from anxiety disorder are more likely to use alcohol as a way of medicating themselves. And f lastly, I'm going to mention access. Access to alcohol is one of the factors that um, uh, risk factors for becoming alcoholics. There's one more thing you need to know about alcohol. This comes out in every exam, which is you need to be able to calculate units of alcohol. And the way to calculate them is one unit of alcohol equals 10 milliliters of pure alcohol. So when you know the percentage volume in, in any drink, uh, you multiply that and you get the number of units. OK, so that's all I'm going to say about alcohol and drugs. Um, I'm going to move to neurocognitive. So that is the dementias and the acute confusional states. This is also very important. So what you get is uh, an elderly person in hospital who appears confused and, and they might have dementia or they might have delirium. So. Dementia is a degeneration of the brain, is irreversible, and it occurs over long periods of time. Um, there are uh, four uh, types of dementia, or four disorders that cause dementia. Alzheimer's, um, vascular dementia, the difference between the two is Alzheimer's is progressive and tends to affect mainly memory. Uh, and vascular dementia, which uh, affects a, a wider functioning of, of the body and that tends to be stepwise. So there, there can be period, long periods without any deterioration followed by acute deteriorations, but is also irreversible. There is two dementias with uh, names as well as Alzheimer's. Lewy body dementia, which is a dementia that also has um, uh, psychotic symptoms, uh, but responds very badly to antipsychotics. And then frontal lobe dementia, which occurs much quicker and that affects the frontal lobe and therefore affects personality and uh, disinhibition before it affects memory. Acute confusional state is normally caused by an injury to the brain, uh, but that is usually from another part of the body. So uh, uh, ischemia or infections or drugs, anticholinergic drugs, affect functioning of the brain, and that makes people appear and dis um, disoriented, uh, and they have symptoms similar to those of dementia. They often are agitated and confabulated, just like people with dementia. But th that's the important thing to know about the difference between the two. The, the thing uh, about dementia and acute confusional state is the prevalence. So um, uh, uh, after 65, the prevalence goes up and uh, people over 85, uh, about one in four uh, suffer from dementia. It's a huge disorder um, and, and you meet them in hospitals. So the percentages of people with uh, uh, dementia or delirium in hospitals are staggering once you go up from 65. So if you work in a hospital, you're going to come across dementia and delirium for sure. That's all I'm going to say about neurocognitive uh, disorders, because I'm going to talk a little bit about neurodevelopmental disorders. Neurodevelopmental disorders are those that um, uh, happened uh, from early childhood. They're to do with the way the brain develops. Yes. So there's a couple of words to know about the way the brain develops. One is the idea of neurodevelopment. So neurodevelopment, the way the, the way a brain wires itself and becomes an adult brain. So all brains are designed to wire themselves up from birth to year three. 
Yes, um, uh, we are born with one of the most underdeveloped brains of any species. Yes, and sometimes things go wrong during that development. Sometimes things go different, not necessarily wrong. So there's the idea of neurodiversity. It's the idea that not all brains get wired the same way. And one example that I like to quote is the um, uh, being left-handed. Le being left-handed is uh, something going uh, wrong during development. That means that brains are different for left-handed people than right-handed people. Now, it used to be uh, considered a disorder and, and a disability, um, but actually we understand now that um, uh, being left-handed uh, is just a, di a, a diversity issue. Now, people argue that a lot of what we call neurodevelopmental disorders are also neurodiversity, and the difference is whether they affect your functioning or not. So people are different, but not necessarily have a disorder. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about, that neurodevelopmental disorders. So there are many neurodevelopmental disorders, but I'm going to focus on two, the two big ones, ADHD and autism. So ADHD, 3% of children will will have it. Um, um, the symptoms, there's three symptoms, like in autism. So three symptoms, AD, attention deficit, which means that people are distractible, they forget things, they are disorganized, they can't complete things and they avoid anything that causes effort. Sometimes girls also appear in a daze. So that's symptom number one, attention deficit. Symptom, symptom number two is hyperactivity. So attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. And hyperactivity means that they fidget, they can't stop moving, they move all the time and they're full of energy. And this is particularly noticeable in little boys. Yes. So that's the second symptom that's in the name. The third symptom that is not in the name, but it is pretty important, is impulsivity. So kids with ADHD interrupt people, they get up in class, all the time and they can't wait for their turns um, and they blurt out answers very quickly and that's the third symptom of ADHD. Um, the, in ADHD those symptoms need to be present from early childhood from three or four and across context you don't just get ADHD in school and not at home. Um, the, the, the other uh, neurodevelopmental disorder, autism, also has three symptoms, although they're a bit more complex. So the first cluster of symptoms is uh, disorders of language and communication. So kids with autism have speech delay, they don't use pronouns way, well, sometimes echolalia, and sometimes they, use, they have very odd use of language. The second uh, symptom is uh, um, poor social understanding or social communication. So they're not able to pick up what other people are doing. They don't have a theory of mind of other people. So very often they don't make eye contact because they don't feel they need it. They're not interested. It's very difficult for them to show any empathy and they often don't have any need to connect, con um, connect to other people um, and sometimes use language in uh, by the sound of it as opposed to wanting to communicate anything. And the third symptom of autism um, is the idea that they have very narrow interests and their experience of their comfortable experience are uh, um, circumscribed to small areas of life. So they often have uh, very little interest for imagination or imagination themselves, but they uh, they soak up facts and that's what they're interested in. They, they like routines and things to be always the same and in an order. And when things get changed, they, they, they become very anxious and they find it really difficult. They tend to be focused in very narrow aspects, you know. Um, so I had a, a patient who had been collecting highway cones uh, for 20 years, you know, only highway cones, you know, uh, very focused, very narrow and very rigid. And often that goes with a lot of anxiety. So that's the um, diagnosis of autism. Now, um, um, ADHD and autism overlap, uh, but they don't just overlap. Uh, they overlap with normality. So, um, so uh, in things like ADHD, uh, there are people with a little bit and people with uh, a lot. And uh, at one point, uh, we need to make as clinicians a decision uh, uh, between who gets a diagnosis and who is just a little bit ADHD. And that's important because of access to treatment, which is very effect effective for ADHD, but we don't have any treatment for autism. So where do you draw that line? Often depends on how well adjusted people 
are and how uh, and all the faculties that they have. So if you can't concentrate but you're very bright, that won't cause much disability. Same thing happens with autism. There's a huge spectrum, only we divide it in two bits. So there is the people who are autistic to the point where they can't function at all. So extremely disabled people. And, and that's a very easy to find threshold. But then there is a variation of people who are quite symptomatic of autism, but they're able to function quite well. And we call those high functioning autism. And then there's the people who have some autistic features, but they don't cause much impairment. In fact, sometimes some autistic features are an asset, particularly for people like mathematicians or engineers. Uh, so that changed the name from autism to autism spectrum disorders. And the bits at the bottom of that spectrum we call high functioning autism. And that's all I'm going to say about neurodevelopmental disorders. So I can't finish without mentioning personality disorders. It's 5% of the population is, is very big, but they are very comorbid with all the other uh, uh, pathology. Um, personality disorders are um, uh, conceptually difficult uh, because this is not people who have a disorder. These are people who are disordered. So what's wrong with them is who they are. Personality is an enduring pattern of behavior. It's re really the way people do things. Um, and if it causes suffering to self of others, then we call it a personality disorder. And we have many uh, names for many types of personality disorders. Uh, some are uh, like paranoid. They are people who are always uh, worried about uh, uh, things happening to them. Uh, schizoid which are people who uh, avoid other people continuously or schizotypical, which are people who have very weird beliefs but not quite into delusions, but uh, they're like that all their lives. This is what we call cluster A. Um, we think that's a mixture of low-level psychosis and autism. Um, um, uh, the, the cluster B is more interesting that includes antisocial behavior that's what people normally call the psychopaths and borderline personality disorder which is very common in young women and histrionic personality disorder which is um, common in young people too and then narcissistic personality disorder which has been brought into national fame um, due to high profile people having clear, clearly the personality disorder and then there's the cluster C which are the people who are, are suffering by themselves and they, they bother very um, other people avoid and personality disorder people who avoid other people at all and they can't function uh, they suffer but they don't bring much suffering to other people or depend personality disorders, people who can't function unless they are clinging on to somebody else. And then the anancastic, which is another way of saying low-level OCD. Um, uh, so if you've seen uh, as good as it gets, then Jack Nicholson personality has an anancastic personality disorder. I'm going to talk about two of them, antisocial personality disorder and emotionally unstable personality disorder, which used to be called borderline, because they are the two most common ones. So antisocial is uh, the um, uh, what all the pe people call psychopaths. So these are people who are irresponsible. They, they're irresponsible even towards the law, um, and they don't care if they harm other people. In fact, often will go out of their way to harm other people. They're deceitful. They manipulate other people. They're callous. They don't experience guilt or remorse. And sometimes when they need to, they can be extremely violent and, and impulsive without that bothering them at all. Um, it's a personality. Some people have traits. Uh, some Having some traits might be adaptive in certain circumstances, but is classed as a disorder. Same thing with emotionally unstable uh, personality disorder, which is more common in, in women, uh, often women who've been sexually abused, which uh, poses the question, is this a personality disorder or is just how trauma manifests itself? Um, nonetheless, it's a pattern of behavior which is quite identifiable. So these are uh, people who have a distorted image of themselves, uh, often quite preoccupied with it. They have intense superficial feelings and they have very difficult maintaining relationships. They often uh, um, in, um, in, um, take um, risks and self-harm and they complain of having a sense of emptiness and not knowing who they are and often have lots of other problems with self-control and that's what defines uh, emotionally unstable personality disorder and that's all I'm going to cover. So 
the idea of the uh, conditions, the ones who I'm not covering, eating disorders, functional somatic symptoms, learning disabilities and perinatal psychiatry. But the ones we've covered, depression and anxiety, the two big ones that overlap, and psychosis that overlaps with depression, um, uh, and it's quite severe and causes a lot of suffering to a lot of people. Then alcohol and dementia, which are the more organic type of psychiatry, and then the neurodevelopmental disorders of people who are born different and personality disorders, people who grow up to be different. And those are the main conditions. So that sums up uh, my last of the four lectures on conditions. And uh, I hope that piques your interest and I'm looking forward to going in more depth about all of this in year four. So thank you very much.